Um, so this is a little different because you know it's less about the technology itself and more about the process and the community and how we work together to produce new standards. So, um, so I think it's a nice way of tying together all the stuff that we've talked about already. So to moderate this session, we have um, Liza Gardner from uh, Cloud4, and um, take it away. Sure, great. So I think that you know you just kind of stole what I was going to say, which was pretty much that this is a great session to end the day on. I think it pulls together a lot of the threads that we've been talking about all day, and I think that there will be some fun discussion about all the standards fun. So to start us off today, um, Brian's going to give us a, a little bit of an introductory context. He's with the Apollo Group and is co-author of the Extensible Web Manifesto, about which we will be speaking today. He's also the chair of the W3C uh, community group on the same, member of many things, expert, I'm sure, of many of those things as well. Uh, take it away. OK, so um, I'm going to talk about uh, evolution committees and revolutions. Um, in case you know me online, um, some people have trouble. They say I don't look like that, so this is who I am. Say hi to me. Um, <clears throat> so I work for the, the front end platform team at the Apollo Education Group, and uh, we do online education, uh, higher ed, um, at a pretty large scale for education. Um, and uh, in my personal life, uh, I'm involved in these things on the top here. So I, there's this big cross section for me of uh, has me thinking really a lot about standards. And so um, I'm just going to throw us way back for brief. <laughs> um, our concept of standards really comes from like industrialization. Suddenly we grew like amazing complexity and scale. And we realized like pretty quickly, like snap, this is really hard. Like we don't really know how to do this. And actually we still don't really know how to do it. But um, this is the beginning of professional engineers. And um, these engineering associations started and engineers went, we need some controls around this stuff. Like we need standards. And so they started and they created these standards and they were regional and incompatible. And, um, they found out some valuable lessons, like technically great ideas that you can't actually get implemented. They're not worth much. And at that time, the physical resource makers had veto power. So they said, no, you can, it's going to cost too much. We can't do that. Um, but as these companies scaled to ginormous size, they learned the value of internal standards and slowly changed their mind about external standards, too. And part of the reason that that was possible is because of things like this. 1903, the Great Baltimore Fire wiped out like Baltimore, <laughs> like it was a big deal. Um, uh, there were over 600 variants of hose and size coupling. So like people showed up, they weren't like hateful and rude, like they showed up, but they couldn't help. And uh, so things like this made it really acutely aware to a lot of people that we need standards. And so they started in the UK and then um, in the US, we started uh, doing it too. And the, finally, I think we're getting to the point that I'm going to start on here, which is um, our approach to standards has changed over time. Um, we've tried lots of things, and every once in a while, um, we need a little revolution to say, hey, you're, you're not thinking about this properly. And um, it's worth learning from what's happened before, too, because pretty much everything that's been waged about standards that we're saying now has been waged in the past. Um, and here's what we know. We know that standards are necessary at some level. They're really hard. Um, and that they're technically better at the last miles than the first ones. They're not the great, greatest source of innovation, but they're really the only ones that are capable of crossing the, the boundary to this is really a standard. And, um, but I'm emphasizing this. They're trying to solve problems that are actually fluid, right? If environments aren't the stasis, right? And in the 60s, things changed. IBM became this giant monolith, and the, like everything was theirs. But software like changed the game and got us thinking about how to solve a problem at higher levels. Um, so here's two things I want to compare and contrast: is the thing on the uh, your left <laughs> um, is EDI, and it was really popular. If you want to do business in the 80s, you better do this. But it's really brittle, and it's really specific. And there's no way that you can do cats, right? Like, just, it doesn't support cats. But this thing on the other side, this is intellectually driven by a small group at Cambridge, uh, IBM. And um, 
it was nurtured and then when they kind of had it figured out and it competed a little bit, then they put it through standards. And it's a really generalized model and that means that people can do new things, right? Somebody came along and said, you know what the web needs? Kittens, right? Um, same thing kind of happened with uh, network architecture. Um, the um, ISO tried to standardize a, a network stack and they spent 10 years doing that. Um, but meanwhile, somewhere kind of late through that, um, Vince Cerf and some guys went to uh, ARPA and they focused on a smaller scale of agreement and running code. And um, they got in the door and that's why we have the internet. So uh, adoption matters again, but there's a shift here, right? Like now the makers, they're not pushing iron and steel, right? They're pushing bits and bits are cheap, right? Um, so then when Tim comes along, Tim Berners-Lee creates the web, um, it's like measurably worse on a number of axes than a whole bunch of things that were available at the time. Um, but it had a really, really low ba barrier to entry. You could just view source and you you're in, you know? Um, and it had, it had enough to do useful things. Um, so it got started and pretty soon all of those shortcomings became evident and uh, we started to fragment and there was this worry that, oh no, now it's just gonna be chaos. So we created the W3C and at first there was really great progress um, because it was last mile sorts of things that there were things that already looked kind of inevitable and we just needed a lot of people to finalize agreement. Um, but then we went down this like decade long foray into X whatever, right? <laughs> or W whatever, uh, XML, XSL, XPath, XQuery, like, I mean, let's just forget it, right? The interesting thing here is that developers became the new veto power and important innovators, right? So raise your hand if you use um, XML stuff, like not much anymore, right? Like it's, it's not what we use, right? We use jQuery, or yeah. <laughs> Let's, we all do use jQuery, but um, we use JSON, right? And JSON, um, you know, was kind of discovered, but also kind of, you know, incubated and, and happened because we all went good enough for a lot of stuff, right? Um, so uh, these high level observations that technical superiority ultimately means little. Um, there's all kinds of different advantages that can trump it when we get to like standard scale. And that software is a great equalizer. It, it has the potential to empower developers. Um, standardization in the small is easier than in the large and when you do it in the small, these adjacent possibles, they become possible. So you build something and somebody will build on top of it. And when they build on top of it, they won't do it in a standards body, right? They'll do it out in the open and they have a little bit more freedom to make harder decisions and get it out there and compete. And eventually, um, when we have things that start to look inevitable, we can kind of do the archeology span and find out where the common ground is. And then we can send it to a standards body. And if you look at this from a distance, it looks a lot more like a living system than a machine. Um, it looks like something evolved, not something that's highly, highly designed. Um, so here's, here's my point anyway. Um, we've changed standards in the past and for good reasons when a little revolution happened. And I think it's time that we change them again. Um, and so step one uh, is can we get everybody to agree to some fundamental principles about what we mean? So step one is the extensible web manifesto where we kind of articulated, this is what we're talking about. Can we, can we get there, right? Um, and this is about, if you're not familiar with it, um, there's just a couple of points in it that I think are really important. If we focus on new ideas and standards bodies, we should start with primitives, right? Don't start with these very, very high declarative things. Start low and let's build up and see what happens and gain data. Um, and Let's focus on excavating the things that are high level so we can, find, we can explain the magic that's in the platform so that uh, we can tweak it slightly and innovate outside. Um, tighten the feedback loop. We need to find a way to include developers and traditional means they're not gonna work. Um, we can't have 200,000 developers on a mailing list every day throwing things back and forth. Um, and when we do have a spec um, that is uh, laid out. Um, let's 
probably fill it. Let's have an implementation that's not by the browsers, if possible. Uh, so there are good examples of this. And um, I think we've seen uh, some interesting things with like, uh, people who are traditionally spec authors doing this. So uh, web MIDI stuff uh, Chris did as a polyfill. Rock. <laughs> um, we have guys who are authors of the HTML uh, spec, right? And um, so some people will debate that. But um, you know, instead of just sitting there arguing about things, they, they create a tag with Polymer. And they say, this is what I'm thinking, guys. What do you, what do you think? And really, a lot of them so far have been like, yeah, we don't think so. <laughs> Um, but that's useful because it it's, it's turns into, but here's what we can all agree on, right? So um, that's it. Um, how did I do for time? Okay. You did pretty good. good. All right. So uh, thanks, Brian, for that introduction. Um, you know, view source and you're in is a pretty inclusive promise. You know, it's. It's part of how we how we look at the web, but so now we're we're going to start a little bit blunt um, with some questions. But before I do that, I should mention who the people are sitting next to me. Alex Russell on the end here. He works at Google. He works on Chrome. He works on web workers. He works on service workers. Let's see. Oh gosh, he works on web components. Kind of all of the things. So um, and Divya Manian sitting next to me here um, has her name attached to all sorts of great uh, things out in the community. Uh, a lot around HTML5. So HTML5, please. Uh, HTML5 boilerplate and also move the web forward. She's with Adobe. So um, oh, over here we have Adrian. Adrian Bateman. He's with Microsoft. He's fighting the good fight while leading the uh, the program manager of the developers on Internet Explorer. He mentioned to me that he also wants IE8 to die in a fire. So I thought I would <laughs> mention on his behalf. <laughs> <laughs> So, I, you know, I didn't want him to have to necessarily say that, but he, he allowed me to. So Kenneth here on the end it works at, at Intel and is uh, quite involved in exposing device APIs on the web where possible, including the crosswalk runtime and also working on Chromium within Intel. So, like I said, I'm going to start a bit blunt here by, uh, by stating what I, I guess is an opinion, but perhaps accepted or agreed upon by you guys, and that is that really Flexbox took forever. There's a lot of time. And, and in that respect, looking at it from the standards process, where are we wasting our time? Whether on Flexbox or other similar standards, where do you guys think we're wasting our time? And I'll, I'll let Divya take this first. Because <laughs> she's definitely she's ready for everywhere. it. I am ready for this. Because uh, I spent uh, one, well, how much? Four years uh, trying to work on the standards body. And I joined Adobe uh, to represent web platform team at Adobe uh, in the standards bodies. And I quit in a year. And I moved to uh, some other stuff. Um, and one of the reasons is this, wasting time. Because uh, there's a lot of waste of time that happens with standards bodies. At Adobe, we pursue a lot of features. Uh, we pursue blend modes. Uh, and blend modes are really awesome, cool things that's going to happen. It's going to happen soon, guys. It's happening. Um, so. And then there is a series of shapes. We worked on regions. We worked, spent at least three years on regions, which Google said, well, screw your three years of work. Too bad. And then uh, we did all of our other stuff. So there's a lot of waste of time. And I think this is very important for discussion to have. And a lot of waste of time happens in the mailing list and in uh, the weekly meetings. And a lot of time it happens because there's somebody who has a lot of time that you don't. And they would be saying something like, I don't agree with this particular syntax. It should have a vowel or another digit or something like that. And you ha don't have time to waste to reply to such nonsense. But you have to, because otherwise your proposal will not get accepted. So it's, uh, you know, do you waste time there? Or do you do things that are interesting? So you have to decide. And that's where most of the time gets wasted. What do you think, Alex? I can sort of see you squirming a touch. <laughs> uh, well, I'm, not, I'm squirming in agreement. Um, the, so for, for background, um, my, my most recent uh, experience with the pain that Divya is, is uh, expressing came with the promises spec in uh, ECMAScript. So we, in 2013, in probably February, had a thing that hang, hung together, and we sort of had agreement on it. The March meeting of um, 2013, we thought we had general agreement about 
a, a sort of a cut down version of an overall promises thing that was A plus compatible that we'd spend a bunch of time working with stakeholders to get done. Um, anyway, I'm going to fast forward to uh, early 2014. Right, early this year, we had yet another series of flare-ups after wasting something like another six or eight months um, on inconsequential debate uh, to try to get something done. And lar largely heroically brought over the line by Dominic, um, who sort of uh, picked up the ball after I rage quit on the process. Um, and uh, this speaks to, on the one hand, the exact dynamics you're talking about, about requiring the, the notion of consensus before, without um, getting something uh, valuable in people's hands. Now, promises should have been an, a slam dunk, right? Promises should have been the easiest thing in the world because every JavaScript library on the planet has something that looks like promises. And in fact, when we started this design exercise, Jake and Eric Arvidsson and I, and with Dominic's help and Mark Miller's help, we sort of went through all of the catalog of the popular promises libraries and all the antecedents and all the cross-language comparisons and it tried to come up with something that looked good. Um, and extract the common core out of this. Um, and yet everyone has an opinion. So um, it's not clear that the standards processes that require consensus are necessarily the way to make progress. It would be better if we can make progress through science, right? We can go and we can look at the world and figure out who's doing the most of what and see what deserves to be sort of written down in the dictionary. I sort of think of it like slang and dictionary. Like we grow slang just sort of the way we um, pick up a word and then toss it out. So um, but if it's really popular, it gets written into the dictionary. Am I hearing decides, that there's too though, much right? consensus, or is it that the questions, too much, well, or too much reliance on consensus, not, or is it that the discussion points are too broad? I mean, it, no, I think, I think the problem is that, um, like, who decides? Mm, so, who, who should be consulted? Like, who should be in charge of this? Like, yep. there's, you know, consensus means that everybody gets to say something, and as Alex said, like, everybody has an opinion. You know, the reason these things take forever is because everybody wants their say, everybody wants to put their little stamp on the spec. And in the absence of that, if we want, if we want to do something else, then how do we decide who's going to be in charge? Yep. Like, how do we short circuit that? Right. Like, what, and I, what, and I, what's like, do we just Do we just go into a closed room and say, like, you have to pay to get in here, or you have <laughs> to, like, pass some tests to get in here? Or you have so, to solve some riddle to get in here. Like, how do you do that? <laughs> let, let me let me just suggest that I think one of the worst things that we've ever done as a series of communities, because it's not just one place, right? We don't talk very much, and that's another topic for debate here. Um, but one of the, uh, despite the talking too much on mailing lists, um, mailing lists are the worst form of human communication yet invented. Um, I submit this for challenge. Um, so how, how should people, how do you think would be a better alternative for people to communicate about these things? I think that when these processes go well, we do it by creating small communities of people who are both informed and invested in the topics. Because the larger community is going to be able to take signals about whether or not something is healthy from experts. Um, not everybody is an expert and maybe everybody does have an opinion, but getting those opinions from an opinion to an informed opinion generally requires that people read up on things. And so to do that, you often want to build from a small um, set of tests about an idea, and uh, hopefully there's competition. But you know, once those, I, those uh, ev that first primordial set of evolutions happens, you can start to grow the group of people who are invested and involved if the platform supports it. Um, we have this challenge in a bunch of places where promises were easy, and I kept saying that the only goal for promises was that there was a spec, right? Because the version that we have now isn't good. <laughs> Flat out has tons of missing features, it's not great, and its large value is that it is the one thing that you can call promises, right? So, so that, is, that is the place where standards provide value is that we then can all agree that it's the thing. So you sort of have to like thread the needle to get there, but getting that early evolution going without requiring that you boil an entire 2,000 person mailing list of ideas before anyone will start any debate on anything is, is really a recipe for failure. Um, we've been experimenting with using GitHub to build new things, but that's only one attempt. The one thing that I want to say is I feel like uh, most of the browser vendors lack trust. They don't trust anybody else. Um, they think Google engineers think Google engineers are the best at doing what is uh, to be done. Microsoft engineers will think the same way. Uh, you know, Mozilla engineers would think the same way too. So, and that lack of trust, that means that outside players like Adobe and Intel, when they come in, they basically don't have any leg to stand on, and they would have to depend on somebody else to verify them, wet them, and then politics enters into the play, and then becomes like, well, is your feature important to our vested interests? 
I'm going to then, submit the experience of service workers as a, as a key. Um, and Alex, we're going to be able to talk about service workers specifically in the next sure. question. So I want to make sure that okay. we get it. I, I, I am neglecting our audience mm -hmm. members because they're behind me and I wasn't paying attention. But we've got a number of people queued up who would like to ask um, or, or make a comment yeah, about uh, this. Okay, so, so actually my, my response is from something probably like five or six minutes ago because I was okay. queued up that long ago. But Sorry, I just wanted that. to say in the terms of consensus, you know, no successful software project works by like multi-vendor consensus in building the project. We have, you know, the, the project lead, right? And, and so I just think that's an interesting thing to keep in mind when you say, how can we be successful? And, and the web has a lot more constraints because we are shipping literally multiple pieces of software, multiple browsers that need to implement these things. But that's partially probably why we're in such a, a situation, so. So. Um, um, and I want to take, uh, make sure we got Jonas ready to go. Um, okay. Brian, yep. Um, well, I, I just like to offer that um, as something to consider is that um, the, the best thing is actually the best thing you can actually get, right? So, uh, <laughs> what, so what we see in history throughout all these things and what Alex is just saying here, um, like there are problems, promises, and th it's not the best promises, but it's standard promises. And that's pretty awesome, right? Um, so shipping is a good feature. So what so like what what we need is a way to shortcut a lot of these things and figure out how to grow them in the community. Um, one of the things I'm working on is um, how we can set up sort of meetups that engage developers and have them review specs and work on polyfills and things and feed that without all of the noise back into the groups so that we can avoid you guys are talking about regions. Um, how long was that? Four years? OK, there are features in CSS that are 15 years, right? So I wish. I have envy of your delays. <laughs> <laughs> Jonas, I'd like you to get a chance here. Uh, yeah, so um, I, I, I think that one of the comments that Alex made was that having a small group of people that are actually informed is like it, it, it is extremely important to find a, a right size group with the right set of people. Like we have kind of two extremes in, for example, uh, so Hixi, who does who wrote, does the what we G version of HTML, who many times sort of goes alone. At least this is the impression that um, I have. I guess I should just speak for myself. But he he, he basically uh, that the working mode there is is generally sort of the editor decides. He tries to collect as much information and make sort of a scientifically correct decision. And then on the other hand, side, we have actually, funnily enough, the same specification in, in W3C space where there's a mailing list of hundreds of people uh, and that everyone opines about every single thing and every decision is ba or every opinion is sort of expressed with extremely little data. This, this is my experience having wor written this one website and I want a feature that like implements my whole website in a single ta tag. Like, and, and that also results basically in disaster. And so, so um, Dave Herman, who I'll speak for a little bit here, tends to talk about like a layers of an onion where you have, you start with a small group of people and then slowly grow, grow that and take input, but, but do it instead of like shooting off your proposal to mailing list, actually seek out people you think could have valuable information and then adjust the proposal as, as the group of experts grows. I want to get Yoav's input on this or feedback on this, and then I want to move on to the next question. So, Hi. Um, just regarding what uh, Divya said uh, regarding uh, browser vendors and trust that they don't trust, for example, Chrome doesn't trust people outside of Google. My personal experience was r r that this is really not the, not the case, and. The Oprah folks also, they have all the trust in the world when it comes to doing black work. So I don't think that's true for as a general rule. And regarding everything uh, Alex said, I just want to support it that, again, the RICG's experience is that we have to form small groups of developers and various browser vendors and work in a focused way on a single problem, get it solved, move on. Otherwise, it drags forever. I think so. Um, I, I think we've seen a lot of success in that lately with like people doing like smaller specs and trying to have more focus. 
uh, one of the working groups where we did the opposite was like the SysApps working group where we tried to solve all the problems of the world and we produced absolutely nothing until people started, why, well, can't we do simple things like the vibrate spec? It's like one function, very simple, you can standardize it, then you can go and ask developers, you can get feedback. The developers actually understand what, what they're looking at because if you have this huge spec, no one will read it like developers, they don't get all these small details, the spec word, the, the wording is slightly different, and, and then you don't get the feedback, and then first at the last mile, where this is almost becoming a standard, well, then everyone, they drops in and they give all their different opinion, and everything goes like, oh my, I thought we were on the same yeah. page, and what's happening now? Yeah. And it's probably what you saw with the promises as well, so right? So I'm kind of hearing a, a few themes here before we move on to the, the next uh, topic here. I'm, I'm hearing a lot of uh, notion that there's a lot of noise in the process and that we're, we're working on things that are a little bit monolithic and if we break those down into tasks that are more manageable by smaller teams, that that, that can help us move faster. So I'm going to move on to a, another uh, discussion about something that people, a, a number of people uh, view as something that didn't go quite right. I guess the way that I worded it is that AppCache was kind of a train wreck. Um, and in light of how the standards process is evolving or changing maybe a little bit for the better, are there changes that have been happening that can help service worker be more successful than AppCache was? Well, I, I want to start um, by giving credit to Andrew Betts and Jake Archibald um, for getting um, the process started that has ended us up at a place where service worker is getting implemented quite broadly. Um, and, lo and looks like a better, obviously it's my feature, so I'm gonna say it looks great. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, the process was fundamentally different to the way that AppCache was designed. So the history here is that there was a project called Google Gears, um, which attempted to flesh out some of these ideas in a hostile environment. It had to be a plugin for IE because IE was dead. Um, it had to be a plugin for Safari because you know, there wasn't really much to be done and for Firefox, and so it was difficult. It had to be implemented multiple times. But they came up with one solution, and then um, it was clear that Gears was going to die, uh, and so when Chrome came about, it was like, well, let's get everything into HTML. And so there was a, a deliberative process of writing down what Gears did. And, H and AppCache, um, to, to some of Hixie's credit, is a coherent way of thinking about exactly what Gears did inside of HTML without re-examining whether or not it was a good idea or a bad idea. Um, it had the fundamental flaw of being a very high level feature without any extensibility whatsoever. So that when something goes wrong with AppCache, and much the way that when something goes wrong with CSS, it's effectively a closed box. You're completely screwed because you have none of the latent power of any of the intermediate systems in there, right? Like think about how an image is requested. An image starts with an imaged element, and then it goes to the network, it fetches some stuff, it gets some bytes back, it picks an image decoder, it decodes it, and it paints them. Right, these are all steps that we can enumerate, things that there should be APIs for. And in some cases, there are on the platform, but you can't plug into just that bit of image when you want to override, say, an image format. That panel made me nuts, right? We're sitting here thinking about how Mozilla may or may not approach a particular image format in the future and without any data and no ability whatsoever for us as a community to go plug in our own image decoders, despite the fact that every browser represented here has invested very heavily in ASMJS and has workers with transferables. We could be do doing image decoding on our own off-thread if there was a way to plumb in our own image data to images and just to be part of that image request lifecycle, right? It is crazy pants that we can't be part of that today, that we're sitting here having a debate about what browser vendors with a lot of power are going to do tomorrow. Right? That is the goal of the Extensible Web Manifesto, is to get us to a place where things are layered and explained in such a way that you can plug in when you want some of the power or you want to play inside the framework but don't want to have to reinvent the whole thing. So yeah, so inaccessibility is, is definitely an issue here. I want to make sure the audience on the floor gets a chance to answer. Is, does Mark already have um, a, yep. All right. I, would, it, it, I was on the queue for the last one. So. Oh, oh, do you, do, oh, I'm sorry about that. Is anyone, is anyone ready to speak to this current um, discussion, or should I stick with the panel for the moment? Oh, Jonas again? I think it's David. It's no, David. David, okay. David Barron. I mean, while we're waiting for the yes, microphone, I, I think um, you know, AppCache is a great example of all kinds of train wreck. It's not just like one problem. <laughs> um, this is like the perfect case study in how not to build a feature. Right. And so, you know, it was in the spec in 2008, and it was there for years, littered in tiny pieces throughout this huge monolithic spec that was very difficult for anybody to evaluate because there were so many tiny pieces of it. And so, you know, I, I think, you know, we've heard 
in several of the sessions today, this desire to focus on small problems, like to work on um, one problem at a time, to define this in a way which is comprehensible, and not just by standardistas, but by web developers as well. And so like, I think that's one of the problems as well with AppCache was it was really hard to review and see how it was going to work and how it interacted with other parts of the system. But it also was an API, so it wasn't possible to just sort of sit down and write down some code. And I, I, Jake comes back to this concept a lot of like, sit down and write down some code and say, how would my thing interact with this if I was just even reasoning about the control flow? Because there's no control flow. It's only high level. And so the sort of the appeal that we've come to, um, first with web components and now with service worker, is to say, look, we don't necessarily know the answer, and we're not going to pretend like we're going to figure this out on a mailing list. It is the worst possible environment for detecting software fitness. <laughs> so no mailing list. That's, that's what no, we're no, no, no. It's just that like a mailing list <laughs> might be fine for something. Yet. I haven't identified what it is yet, <laughs> but it might be fine for something. But it's also so terrible at defining by software fitness. Like decision by mailing list. So David, do, um, out in the audience, would you like to have your say? Are we, sure. are we short a microphone again? Sure. No, I, I have a microphone. Um, Two, two things. I mean, I, I think it, it rubbed me the wrong way a little bit when Alex said it's crazy pants that we don't have this API already. I mean, I think the, you, you have to recognize that the web has evolved to the state it's in. It's evolved from something really simple. And sure, we should add a lot of these things. But the reason it got to where it was is because we started with something simple. And now we're, you're, you're backfilling it with these primitives. Um, I think the other important point about these, about building, about adding more primitives to, about adding more primitives is that sometimes when you talk about adding primitives, you're adding, you're exposing primitives that already exist. And sometimes there aren't really clear primitives that already exist, and you have to make new primitives and then rebuild what you already have on top of those things. And the second thing is a lot more work than the first. Sometimes we, I, I agree that in some cases we do want to do that work, but you have to recognize that it is a lot more work. So for, for um, context here, I've been, uh, Chris Wilson is going to hate me bringing this up, but I continue to bring up the notion that the web audio specification should have some sort of relationship to how audio is played through the audio tag or through the video tag, right? That seems like a pretty clear bit of layering that you should have in the platform. Um, and we don't have it, and it is a lot of work. Um, and I'm willing to be patient about these things, but I do think that as a, as a group, we should be impatient about making progress in this direction. We should not accept the idea that this is the end point that we would like, or that because it happened to have evolved to this place, that this is the next set um, that the next quantum of time should look like this one, right? Progress means doing something differently. So Brian, I want to hear, uh, it looks like you might have a thought on this. And I, I want to get Ilya and Natasha ready, um, queued up to, to have their say as well. Um, so uh, this is kind of a common thing that comes up uh, where we have a, a big deep system like CSS and layout and everything. And um, there are bits of that that are like, they're not even actually spec'd, right? They, they just exist. So like, there's this box tree that isn't really accurately defined anywhere. And so everybody kind of implemented you know, something different. Um, <clears throat> I think actually one browser, who I won't name, doesn't even actually have a box tree, technically. Um, <clears throat> and it's just something that you can like, observe, like it's spooky action right? Like from a distance. You, you know it's there. It's kind of described. Everybody talks about it, but it it's not really spec'd out. It's not the first time we've had this. So yes, it means we might have to invent some things to describe those spooky sorts of things. But that's good. And even if it's imperfect, it's still the best it's we can thing. get. It's yeah. a something. Right. Did, we, did we lose Ilya? Um, no. No, yeah. OK. Uh, so I want to come back to something that, Alex, uh, you said earlier, which is we want to do science, or we want to have some data and, and metrics and all the rest. And I'm hearing a lot of good discussion in terms of how do we improve the process for generating the spec and kind of getting good feedback and all the rest. But even if, let's assume I'm successful at that, I then take that proposal to the vendors and they say, oh, but now you need commitment from everybody. Who else is shipping this thing? 
because I'm not shipping it unless you're shipping it, and we can't ship <laughs> it because if I ship it, and then we can't unship it, and then we're stuck. So, so how do we fix first. that? How, yeah. do we do, how do we do science if we can't ship things that may go wrong? It's a great point. Um, so I'm hopeful about the work we did in Web Components to sort of open up the HTML parser to everybody, because what it's going to allow us to do is to use parses and metrics that we grab from telemetry um, to understand which things are really common in the world so that we can actually make a data-driven case about who's using what and figure out whether or not it's important. This is the same sort of data that we use these days to evaluate whether or not a feature is allowed to die. Right? One of the sort of the, the um, uh, electrified uh, fences of the web platform is the idea of ever taking anything back and breaking some portion of the web's content. Um, and it's only been recently that we've started to use histogram data in, in Chrome telemetry to start informing this question. And we can start to do quite a bit more of that. Um, and so I'm hopeful that as we open up these new primitives, we can start to see, on the one hand, the popular libraries. Right? We've got central repositories and package managers, thank God. Like I remember trying to build big JavaScript without them. So good on you. And we'll be able to get some information from them. We'll start to be able to see and instrument what's important in the runtimes at the API level. And we'll start to be able to instrument things from crawls to sort of understand what sorts of patterns people are using and how they're composing them. Um, and I'm hopeful that these will provide a, a basic form. Um, there's a lot more that we can do. Right? There's lots more instrumentation that we can come up with. And I'm hopeful that we'll start to prioritize and use as a confidence interval the same sort of how much data, how good is it, how fresh is it, sorts of things that we use to make decisions about removing features in Blink today. I just want to give a note of caution, though. Like, you know, I, I'm in, certainly in favor of us exploring uh, having different um, primitives available. Um, the thing which I really worry about is as we start to look at things like the box model or um, various other parts of the internals of browsers, which as a browser vendor, we spend a huge amount of time researching, innovating, trying to improve performance for, that every time we expose a primitive that describes some of that implementation, we risk pinning that implementation and, and removing the opportunity to innovate that black box. And so I don't think that it's always the case that a black box is a bad thing. I think sometimes it, it allows us to abstraction. Yeah, it allows us to innovate in ways which um, which we might not be able to do if we expose everything. I'll see your caution so and raise you the I want to give Natasha a chance to answer, uh, ask her question because she's been waiting an awfully long oh, right, time. No, it's okay. I'll, I'll try and be quick. Yeah. Um, just going back to the small teams thing, one of the issues with small teams, although I, I think it's a, the right way to go forward, is that when you take the spec to a larger audience, then everybody wants to go through the issues of how did you come to those decisions and how did you get to that point? And it's one of my, my job as a technologist, I have to go through those decisions very often. But going back to sort of service worker, and I'm getting some feedback here, so I'm going to take a step this way. Um, going back to the stuff that happened with service worker, one of the things I really liked was the explainer document. It wasn't the spec, it was just an explainer document. It was to say, and I know you guys were the people that were involved in writing that, but that made my job so much easier. I didn't have to ask you about why you came to those those um, uh, those solutions or so, the reasoning behind it, it was all included there. So you're getting ahead, in, in that sense, getting ahead of the questions that you kind of are inevitable exactly. about. Exactly. Like, you have planned for them. And, you know, they're, they're saying, here, we, we had this issue and we came up with the solution. And so people have problems that go, go hang out, go hang, have a look at the explainer document. That could be something to take forward to other specs. Great. I got to move us forward. We're running a little bit behind here. So I, I want to pull us forward and actually talk a little bit about the manifesto we've been skirting around just a bit in terms of like how how it would advise if it, if if it were followed the extensible web manifesto us to um, be thinking about standards as we're moving forward specifically I thought um, I would talk about or we could talk about this is a a, a question inspired by one uh, submitted by Sam Giles. Uh, the, the manifesto encourages the exposure of low-level standards or granularity on a low level. But APIs like Beacon kind of fly in the face of that. They're higher level. Um, looking at that API in particular as it's, as it's moving forward here, how would we reconcile that gap? What things is it doing that are in line with the uh, tenets of the manifesto and what things really differ from it? Um, so, so I think yeah. the, the problem mm -hmm. with, um, you know, the problem with Taking Beacon and doing that using some of these lower level primitives um, ultimately comes down to performance. And this is another area that I worry about with the, um, the approach of making everything low level. So it's true that we could build um, the Beacon API, which is a way of um, having a page send some data to a server, even if, even if it's during unload, and so you don't have to wait around for the response to that. 
Um, it's true that you could build that using a service worker. Um, but we have lots of concerns around um, the impact that service worker might have on the performance of page loading. We spend a, a lot of time on getting pages to time to glass and, and the focus on that. And kind of the counter argument to that has always been, well, service worker is a pay for play thing. Like if you want to use service worker, then you, um, then you accept that that might have some impact, which is fine, except this is for analytics, which is probably going to be on every page. And now suddenly I have a service worker on every page. And now every page is paying this penalty. And I'm not sure that's the right way to go always. And so maybe there's a place for a simple API. This is pretty short spec that just says, here's a way of sending a blob of so data. So is this an server. example of an, a spec, an API that's concise enough that it's easy to just knock out and get done? Or does it have conflicts, do you think? I mean, Brian, do you have a heads up? Um, I think that you know, we have to evaluate these things on you know, a case-by-case -case basis. And, not, not everything can be exposed at the lowest level possible. And I think that where we, uh, where we choose to do that, um, you know, it's debatable, right? Um, so at one point, there was discussion about whether we should have like block storage. That's like really low level. And like nobody writes block storage. Um, and some other people said, OK, that's kind of crazy. But like maybe up a level, that makes sense, you know? Um, so. I, I don't know that there's always a, a kind of one-size-fits-all go-to answer. There might be some things we can't um, get down. But you know, we should think about it. Um, like sensors is a really good one, right? Sensors is pretty low level. It's like a thing of hardware. You know? But um, there are people working on you know, a standard, hey, there's how you do sensors, all of them. And it's actually pretty great. Shaking her head. I mean, I, I feel like as soon as you go into law, first of all, I feel like we're missing the point of browsers live forever. Like that's a thing that happens. Browsers live forever. People are still using a lot of old antiquated browsers. It doesn't even have to be antiquated. People have different hardware systems, and you know, if my mom's using an old version of uh, uh, operating like a Mac, then she can't use the newest Chrome. She can't use the newest Firefox. She's stuck with Firefox 3.4 or something like that. And then she browses the web using that, and that means a lot of web appears broken to her. And she asks me why that's the case, and I'm like, I. You know, I don't know what to say to her, you know, and we do. If you expose all these low-level APIs, and at some point, some people are going to be limited by their hardware configurations to a certain version of the browser, and what do you do then? Like, do you forever support this low-level API, or are you going to just it's say actually, no? The hardware is really, really difficult, yep. because if you take something like a, a camera, yep. like the technology changes yep. like every year. Yep. So if we make like low-level primitives to how a camera works today, Yep. Well, those might not exist two years from now, yep. and there might be new low-level yep. primitives. So some, once in a while, you need to look at the use case. Maybe it's fine. We, we have something higher level API, yeah. like we did with the presentation uh, yeah. API. It's like higher level, and it solves the use case. Jake, did we leave you behind, or are you still got No, no, not quite. I was, I was just wanting to, to, to agree with, with Adrian, really. I, I feel that sometimes, the, uh, by some, the, 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 web, the extensible web manifesto is interpreted uh, as we must only Add things to the platform that are the lowest level that, that we can. Uh, I, I think, yeah, we don't want to do that. Like, you, I want async local storage. I don't want to be told, no, you must use IndexedDB for that. I want to be able to use event target uh, on, on, on my objects rather than include the library for it. Uh, query selector role was a good idea. Uh, we should do that more. Yeah, and by the way, I supported uh, implementing uh, Beacon in Chrome. Um, you know, like because I would prefer that we make progress and figure out how to clean it up. I would prefer that we have a principled way for for thinking about how to make the connections between the things in the platform over time. Um, I don't want to get in. The, I don't want this idea to get in the way of giving developers more power, right? Specifically, if there are new areas where there's a thing you can't do, well, I think the job one is to give developers a way to freaking do it, right? <laughs> and then job two is to figure out how that works. And so we. Job isn't done if you only do the first part. And we've, for a very long time, settled on the notion that we might be binding ourselves into some sort of you know, particular architecture if we expose it uh, as a way of not doing job too. And I, I wanted to push back a little bit on that, because I think the recent history of JavaScript VMs shows pretty dramatically that you can still make forward progress um, even when it, the, the water in front of you looks treacherous and full of sharks. Right? As long as you can figure out ways to 
go fast um, when you're not being asked to do a very specific thing, then in the general case, you can still accelerate things. All right, Chris, I want to hear from Chris uh, out in the audience. So, oh, you might uh, good. Alex, Alex mentioned earlier the audio element and him hassling me about how you build the audio element as a primitive. And that and what we're doing in web audio is actually totally relevant to this question because we've gone and built this web audio API that's actually pretty high level, like on purpose, it was high level, but then we didn't expose all the low level stuff. Like we didn't expose the, how do you get an audio, like an audio output device where it just keeps asking you for more bits and you just have to keep pumping more bits to it. But the problem to my mind is because this was a, a suggestion from Robert O'Callaghan of Mozilla early on, the problem is if you only do that, you're gonna miss a lot of developers. Like me, for example, I never would have started getting into audio programming on the web if I didn't have an API that I could have built this stuff on top of easily. And I think this, this calls out like you have to do both. So now I'm going back through the audio API and recasting it as this layered API where you, you could think of it in this very primitive terms, particularly because that also lets us innovate in the future. It also lets us decide, hey, we need a new type of element in web audio that isn't there today, and we want to try it out in JavaScript. Like, we want to basically polyfill it without having to go and, you know, hand code it into Chrome and into WebKit and everything else. So, so like, the, this idea of there are multiple levels that may be really interesting to develop for is a really critical one to understand. So it doesn't sound like it's necessarily at odds with the manifesto. It's just, like, Not different ways Not of interpretation all. and, you know, general ideas that avoiding orthodoxy and being particularly the fundamental about it. The manifesto begs be... follow-on questions. And I think those questions need to be answered. Interpretation. Yeah. Right. So low is a relative term, right? I mean... I mean, a devil's advocate here, would it help to revisit sort of the, 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 the initial text um, that screams out from the manifesto to sort of explain what it means by low level? Um, is that something that could be perhaps a little bit um, difficult to People understand? can just email us. <laughs> yeah. We're not um, dead. Send it to the not... mailing list is a good idea. Yeah. On the mailing list. All right. Put it, put it on the GitHub. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do that. Yeah, yeah. Send it to Divya. Yeah. All right. I'll troll everybody. Mark, got a comment? Yeah, I, I just, you know, I've historically been a little skeptical about the extensible web manifesto. Hopeful, but skeptical. And, and this conversation's making me feel a bit better about it, I guess, in that I'm hearing the focus on the low and the high level. Uh, and, I, and I think about this in terms of, you know, where I'm a little more comfortable maybe in the IETF, where we didn't just come up with HTTP, we also did TCP IP. You know, we did the low le level capabilities and then allowed people to build on top of that. And, and so that makes me feel better, I guess. There was that blog entry that somebody did, what, about two weeks ago that Alex, you responded to. And I, I had some sympathy with that because one of the scenarios we have here is that we have these low-level capabilities. You know, you look at like NPM and the, ma the, the mess that is the NPM package system because there's a lot of, you know, low-level libraries and people build and you get this kind of chaos there. Aaron Hammer, they have, blogged really uh, effectively about that a while back. You mean, by mess you mean beautiful chaos? A, a thousand flowers blooming, including some, some, some poisonous flowers, yes. Um, and and, and I, I, I liked your response to that. I think, you know, I think it is beautiful chaos. I think that's okay. But it is something that has to be managed over the lifetime of what we're doing too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that is the legitimate role for standards, by the way. Yeah, is that yeah, once, yeah. Once things become clearly standard, right? <laughs> it, it is worth taking a look and GCing, right? <laughs> get, the, get the junk out and go write that stuff in that has survived this evolutionary cycle into the dictionary, right? That is, right. The, that is the goal of evolution, is not for all organisms to continue to live. It is for the organisms that are fit to survive right. to the next right. generation. And that was my comment the first time around, which was, you know, so many people come to standards work with stars in their eyes and say, well, I just have to get it in the standard and it'll be real and we're doing <laughs> R&D here and I just want to Find ways to kill those people. Like, I, it, it, you know, it, right. it, this is about consolidation. It's about building a platform that we can agree upon, and then building on value on top of that. And, and my strategy here is to build markets in which they can fail. Exactly. All right. So I, I want to keep us moving a little bit. I want to shift directions just a bit. Um, right now, in terms of, um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the gap that exists between APIs, especially device APIs uh, exposed for web in browsers versus that which you have access to natively. 
Are there tactics that we can use and some of the stuff we can talk about to move things faster to close that gap a bit, or is this always going to be kind of a game of catch up? And uh, what can we do about it, if anything? Well, <laughs> we, well, I think like we have had seen a lot of progress since we tried to make like smaller specs and solve like small use cases instead of trying to solve like really big use cases. Like, oh, we're going to make a Bluetooth API, so let's solve all, everything you can do with Bluetooth. No, let's try to solve those things that people need or they really want here and now. Something like the, the uh, device orientation lock. People, they want to be able to lock their screen. So it's a very small spec. The problem is, I think, like the biggest gap is, is time to market. We need to be quick at shipping these new things. So how do we do that? How do we, I mean, are we still talking about the same things we've been talking about, like less, less consensus or less of a net thrown around, huge consensus building, less infighting, fewer people working, or like what other thing, are, are, are those the kinds of things? Or? I have a heretical suggestion. Okay. If that's, if that's okay. Heretical, uh, we'll, we'll find out if that's comes. okay. Um, so uh, my colleague Jeff Yaskin is at the back and he's working on a, on a Bluetooth spec. And Bluetooth is, is a particularly ter terrible and terrifying <laughs> aspect of all of this because it is, a, it is very much a hardware spec and you can get things wrong and you can brick devices. Right. If you talk at the right, wrong level, as Jeff has given me a tour of, you can totally brick devices that you carry around in your pocket with you, and that's bad. And exposing that to the web is clearly dangerous. Um, at the same time, uh, we have a security model. It's called the origin model, and we have um, a lot of capabilities that we don't have a way to expose today. And the way we start getting capabilities into the web is by getting everyone in a room and going, guys, guys, what's the API? Right. Which has a bunch of implicit questions about it. and that. Um, idea of sorting out the API before you provide the capability at some very low level um, is quite difficult. And so we don't have any really narrow channels, um, common channels, to map capabilities onto URLs for things which we don't have a standard for yet. Um, and uh, Dmitry Glaskov, who helped write the original explainer document for web components, which we just copied for the service worker, basically, um, uh, he has this idea of something called navigator.connect, which is just sort of a way of thinking about mapping a bunch of other things into service workers and origins, and maybe that could be devices on your system. Obviously, it's up to yeah. the system to mediate it, but that's one possible way forward where we have a very, very, very narrow API, and it's up to runtimes to provide some sort of mapping to those capabilities. So, Jonas? Uh, yeah, so, so device APIs is actually a very... So, so I actually don't think that sort of extensible web... Uh, the, is going to help with device APIs. I think the, the main problem we have with device APIs is security. Like, we just don't know how to expose certain things to the web given the web's current so security model. So, device APIs are sort of special in this sense. They don't. In, in, they well, don't. yes, in, in a sense. There, there's more things than device APIs that are limited by security, but that, that's a very good example. And I actually think that device APIs is a very good example of a place where exposing the low level primitives. Is not isn't the right thing to do. Like the reason, so we've actually had file access in on the web for over a decade, like probably maybe two even, in the form of input type equals file. It's a very terrible API, but it has gotten us like through these many many years, and it has allowed us to do very uh, powerful things. We have yet to figure out how to expose the low level version of that, which is like raw file level access, where a website could just enumerate your hard drive and find all the images and play all your music, right? That, that'll be super cool once we figure it out. But if that was the, like, the first thing we went to, uh, then we would still not have a lot of the things that we have to do to have today, like probably not YouTube. And, and so, so in a sense, though, you're kind of saying that something lowish level that was exposed has actually been extremely useful. It, it could have been useful, but if that would have been, if we had, if we had sort of made that the only thing we had worked on, then we, I think we would have failed. Uh, and so th by going to higher levels and, and only doing higher level, we were able to at least like, move forward a little bit. And, and I agree, like, it, it's good when we can do the, high, the low level thing, but especially when it comes to security, you can actually often solve security problems by going to higher level. Gotcha. I want to hear from Vincent, and then I want to move on to our next question. So uh, I'll keep it short because Jonas uh, particularly addressed some of the points. Um, I'm working on the Bluetooth API with Jeffrey Eskin uh, on the Chrome team as well. And I think that to generalize how do we move faster on, dev on device APIs, it's to figure out the generalized problem of dealing with the hard security and privacy issues, finding a template that works, and being able to employ that to new APIs moving forward where we don't have to you know, go through the entire process again and open up 
you know, questions from scratch. I think that's great. Like really, I, it, it seems sort of obvious when you think about it, right? Like a, a repeatable a, approach and it's, it seems like pretty feasible, right? <laughs> but you know, I, 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 does. I, and I really want us to get a chance to talk about this next question just a bit, because I think it'll give everyone a chance to get a few things off their chest if they so desire. Um, I was wondering if um, some of you might have opinions about how, or, or be able to identify what specific new or evolving APIs seem to be suffering the most from flaws in the process right now. Are there pet things that you are, have in mind that you think really could benefit from improvements to the standards process. Yeah, every, every API, Everything. every single one, <laughs> like they're all broken. Every, yeah. And, you know, th there's a variety of opinions in, in this room and elsewhere about what a possible fix might look like. And there's, you know, this continuum of, um, like, we, we just want it to be a living document, you know, this living standard, this oxymoron of, a document that's never actually a standard because it's always changing um, versus the opposite end of the spectrum of like standards that are never useful because they're always out of date <laughs> and and I think like this is actually the most important problem that we have to solve if we can find a, a happy medium for how we can um, take in proposals for new ideas and not mix them up with the things which are stabilizing and not mix them up with the things that are agreed on and shipped, then I think um, all of the API process, all of the API design, all of the standardization process will get better. I think that's actually the biggest problem we face right now. I mean, I, uh, I agree with uh, Adrian because I think that's, I feel like a lot, there's a rush to focus on cool new features while not focusing on the fundamental structure of deciding on the cool new features. And that leads to a lot of, uh, you know, nonsense features being in the web, and then we are like, oh shit, we should not have done that. And then we are like, oh well, we it's there. App cache that we just discussed. Okay. Well, you know, why would we want to have these things? And I think we are skirting the issue of the fundamental structural problem by keeping talking about the new features and new stuff. I feel like there should be a strong tendency to say no to new features while fixing under underlying fundamental issues. Larry, I want to get, I want to hear from. Larry, I'm right here. All right. Um, I have a lot to say about the standards process, but in particular answer to, to this question, there's a lot of the web platform that is not being worked on and, and that the standards are not very good, but it's old stuff. And who wants to work on old stuff? We went, you know, people come to the process thinking that it's a place for innovation and new ideas. So what when would it's you really, give really for review. Like what's an example of something that's languishing that you think? The file URL scheme. How do you translate files and the file name to a URL that works if I want to put a website on a thumb drive and carry it to somebody else and, and open it up with file URLs? It's completely platform independent. Every, every uh, operating system does it differently. Every implementation is different. And yet, you know, there's nobody who particularly cares about this, even though it seems like an, an important application. I, I think but that's untrue. It's just that you need to put a web server on the thumb drive. <laughs> Jake, you yeah, have yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to SanDisk. But I, but I think this is a general problem, right? This is a general problem with it's really, like, it's really cool. Everybody gets props for coming up with new ideas and brand new things that they want to do. Um, and like finishing things, <laughs> figuring out the detail, like that's actually the really difficult part. And so I, I'd really like it if we could find the right model for us to spend time figuring out some of those details. You know, we seem to spend a huge amount of time um, on my team, like trying to figure out like, why does this website work in this browser and not in this browser? Yeah. Like, why, why does this thing not quite work? Why does this not quite lay out right? Yeah. And it's because the devil's in the detail and like trying to figure out this detail, like doing that last mile is actually really difficult. We need to find a better way of actually figuring that out. I want to add one more thing. One, uh, the thing that I want to add is all the people, if you are suggesting cool new features and advocating for cool new features like Flexbox, make sure you provide the debugging tools to help debug these cool new features too, instead of just going out and talking to everybody else. You should use Flexbox today because it's so cool. Here's this cool demo. But where is the debugging tools for this? You know, you need to provide those too. So getting all the way there, huh? So Jake and I think Mark, let's uh, let's hear what you guys have to say. Uh, a quick one. I, I think that the APIs that are suffering the most at the moment are those that have been uh, needlessly forked by the W3. 
because now we have two like, specs for the same thing, and that's pointless. Give me some examples. Give me some examples. HTML. Uh, XML, code. HTTP request, uh, HTML. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay. Uh, URL as well. URL. <laughs> yeah. Mark, are you? Out there? There you go. Uh, sorry if I'm beating a dead horse from before, but um, <laughs> all dead horses. so um, I have to go back to the low level thing because I know we keep coming back to that and that seems to be a big point of contention. Um, so I personally am a big believer in abstraction. Um, I agree a lot with what Adrian was saying about missed opportunities if you don't provide abstraction. Uh, but I'll, I'll give you the argument about being more nimble, providing more low-level access, enabling developers. Um, let's say you are able to reform the standards process, do these small focus groups, be very task-oriented, move things quickly. How do you avoid missing the boat, though, on like larger architectural arcs of like it, like opportunities? I'm going to give Alex a chance to answer because he looks very antsy, and then we got a wrap. So the the answer there is um, hopefully there is a superstructure in which these efforts take place, and so. Um, some of my fellow reformers about this process have recently run for the W3C Technical Architecture Group, and one I uh, was turned out um, for process reasons. Um, Dominic uh, joined, and so we work for the same company. Anyway, long story short, the hope is that um, there is a body that can redirect enthusiasm for new features into questions about how you explain the old things instead. Um, to, to put pressure back on the question of how does it work, because it's probably already in there. The web is so big, it's so freaking big, the API surface area is enormous, and the implicit API surface area is even larger. That the odds are that the answer is probably already in there someplace. You just need to go dig it out. So instead of giving me a new CSS property, dig it out, give me API, and come back and talk to me. All right. So panelists, thank you so much. There's a lot of stuff going on. I think there's a lot of p questions people still want to talk about. But I think um, we, we kind of ran the gamut fairly well. We, we talked about how um, the amount of noise in the standards processes is, is hampering it to some extent. The uh, scope of some of the projects may be too large to be efficient. Um, and that there's some languishing, less sexy APIs out there that could use love just as much as anything else. So I thank you guys quite quite a lot. Thanks. Thanks, guys. So that is that is it. But don't go anywhere because I have a few wrap up things to say. And uh, then we have the party to go to Akamai. So just give us a second. We have a few technical issues with the final slides. One of the things we'll be doing um, now is giving out some of the prizes. So you have to be in the room to win a prize. So if you're on this list and you're not in the room, then um, we will just roll the dice and give it to anyone randomly who is in the room. Um, so, <laughs> so if you, uh, you feel eligible to win a prize this evening, then uh, you need to get your phone out and go to an on-slide URL, which will hopefully be coming up on the screen in a second. Um, I'm told that Google, Adobe, and Akamai employees are exempt, so, <laughs> so uh, sorry, you can't. You've probably got all of this stuff already, anyway. <laughs> so uh, if you don't work for any of those organizations, then you're welcome to have a go, and uh, hopefully we'll have the URL up in a second.
Great. Is this working? Hooray. OK. <laughs> so we'll start with some thank yous. Um, these are the people you have to thank for today. Um, I curated the event. Ruth Yarnett, who. <laughs> Ruth Yarnett, who's actually gone ahead to Akamai to make sure that the party is, is set up for us, um, has been doing all the event management, which is why this edition of Edge is significantly less shambolic than the last one. And um, we have various people to thank at uh, Adobe and Google and Shape. Um, so, on to the prizes. Now, we. This is the URL, so if you feel eligible to win some prizes this evening, then tap that URL into your phone, and anyone on my list who's not here forfeits their prize to you. So um, we, we applied a highly scientific methodology involving how many times you spoke um, using OnSlide, and um, also how many times you uh, were retweeted by the EdgeConf Twitter account. So um, based on that, the, the winner just by a hair is Patrick Kettner. Patrick, you, you win a, an Adobe, um, uh, what is it called? <laughs> <laughs> Adobe Creative Cloud subscription for one year. So go and see my colleague Alberto and he'll sort you out with that. Sorry, I'm blanking on this stuff. So we also have uh, five uh, Google Chromecasts. So if you're in the room, Mark Yun, Photo Shelter, congratulations. Aid Edwards from the FT, I know you're here. And um, yeah, we're, we're not exempt, so that's fine. <laughs> uh, we, we didn't provide any of the prizes, so that's fine. Um, Sarah Forst, congratulations. Wow, everyone's here, that's, very, that's really cool. Adam Singer, you had, um, Adam's here as well, awesome. Congratulations, Adam. And uh, Charles Covey Brandt, are you here? You are. Congratulations. So you've all won um, Google Chromecasts, or um, we also have Android TVs. So moving on to Android TVs, we have Jack Morgan. Congratulations, Jack. Uh, Jonathan Porter. Oh, OK. Jonathan's not here. Jonathan, are you sure you're not here? No, he's not here. Okay, cool. Wesley, do you want to roll the dice? Yeah. So, if you want a prize, open your phone. So, you you have to have your phone open on this address right now if you want to win this prize. Okay. Anyone has a yellow phone? Yes. Oh, no. I don't see a win. Yes. OK. No yellow. All right, well, let's do it again. Here we go. Keep it open. Oh, we got. Oh, Ada won that one. Again. Ada, no, Ada All right. two things. So, so we, we should have another yellow phone now. Ada, can there you it is, healthy? right there. Random winner. Hooray. All right. Finally. How, how many more should I do, Andrew? Uh, so I think. How many are we out of? I think we're out of Android TVs, right? Are we out um, of OK, TVs? we'll do a couple more just in case. I think, I, Alberto, are we out of, are we, are we allocated? OK, cool. Now we're at Chromecast. OK. So next we have Larry Massinter. Larry, congratulations. Oh, you in the Adobe employee, I'm sorry. Here, I'll pick. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I didn't have that on my list. I did scratch out, but I, I missed one, sorry. Lucas Gons. OK, we don't have a Lucas Gons, so let's roll the dice. We're, roll the dice, here we go. And the lucky winner is. Here we go. <laughs> Oh man, don't don't change the styling to get a yellow screen. <laughs> All right, who 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 has the yellow screen besides Luke? <laughs> Did you just open? 
many, many, many taps. Here it is, right here. All right, uh, David. Hey, David's one. Is are Mozillans allowed to uh, Mozillians? I believe Mozillans are allowed. Okay. I didn't, I didn't hear Mozillans were exempt. So. All right. Do we, do we need another? Um, do, that's, that's it. it. We're okay. out of prizes. Excellent. Hooray. So. So yeah, we like to we like to reward people for contributing to the event. So that's kind of nice. Um, yeah. Yeah, we'll do that separately. Um, okay. So. On to, can someone push space on my computer? <laughs> oh, okay. Right. So on to today's finance, the finances for the event today. So one of the things we do at EdgeConf, which is quite unique, is to tell you what we spent all the money on and where we made all our money. Um, so we made uh, about $40,000. Um, we have Google very largely to thank for a lot of that sponsorship, along with, um, uh, Shape and Instart Logic and Adobe and Akamai. And we spent about $27,000, um, which means that we have $12,453 to donate to Hack the Hood. <laughs> so I'm pleased to say we have Susan Murnett from Hack the Hood who will just uh, uh, tell us a little bit about Hack the Hood, but we've got a quick video to show you first of all. getting too personal about my life, you know what I'm saying? I didn't grow up with a lot of opportunities. Young kid from the streets, you know what I'm saying? Got a lot of fears and worries for my kids as they grow up. My name is Charles Ray Jones Jr., father of Charles Ray Jones III, graduate of Hack the Hood. Not only is he gaining the skills necessary, but he's meeting people who could guide him along the path he chose to go on. Not only information, not only you know, knowledge, but access. Hello everybody, my name is Teresa Flores and I am a visionary catalyst. I created websites for small local businesses in Oakland. My experience was wonderful. It was something that I love to do because I love the people that I worked with and they were so helpful in every aspect. One of our mentors, she assigned us our clients and we would call them, ask them if they wanted a website. We were able to convince them. Um, I'm Akai and I'm here to present my websites that I built for clients. I'm actually doing this to uh, get a feel for web design because uh, I want to either do uh, video game design, um, mechanical engineering or voice acting. And so I'm trying to like get a feel for each of those and see which one I like the most. Technology is something that is going to be vital and it is for me. If more youth are involved, they will be able to build websites and also get into the tech industries by creating personal connections with people that are already working in the tech industry. My name is Eric Sorith and I'm a mentor with Hack the Hood. It was a lot of fun. I would definitely continue to do this. Just seeing the change in Muhammad from when we started to the end of the program, the things that he learned. He did three websites for local businesses, as well as his own personal page. I would love to see this grow and mature and expand into other cities. I think it would be very exciting to be a part of that. They are no longer just passive consumers of what's going on on the internet. They become actively involved in contributing to what the internet is as a whole, and I think that's very empowering. And I think it's just going to change the face of the internet as the youth get more and more involved. So, Susan Murnett, founder of Hack the Hood. First of all, thank you guys so much. This is such a wonderful thing to be 
a recipient of this funding from the EDGE Conference and to have the Financial Times, Andrew, think of us. So I just want to thank everybody for putting the money for this conference to such a good cause. I want to just talk a little bit about Hack the Hood for a minute. Um, I spent uh, eight years working as an executive and a product developer in Silicon Valley, and then I moved to Oakland because it was kind of like Brooklyn where I had lived for many years. And what I discovered was that so many people who actually lived in Oakland felt so shut out of the technology that was happening 30 miles away in the valley, eight miles away in San Francisco and coming to Oakland. And as much as everybody was on their phone, uh, consuming technology, doing gaming, doing messaging, doing e-commerce, um, they had no idea that they could really be consumers. And uh, people were like, gee, getting a job at UPS would be like a fantastic job, but it's a lot of security. So we started Hack the Hood because we wanted to grow a generation of programmers and people working in other jobs in tech who really were not shut out, who could be young people of color from very low income families. So the kids that you saw on the screen from our summer program in Oakland um, all came from families that literally made less than $18,000 a year. They were kids who started out not doing any programming, really avid users of tech on their phone, and um, by the end of the course, they not only all were doing web development using Weebly, but they were learning CSS, HTML, starting to look at PHP. Um, here we are at the end of the summer, and we have uh, kids who are going to be taking classes in computer science, kids who are going to start doing Android development in a workshop with us with um, codepath.org. We were able to take people who see themselves as very isolated, very shut out, very not able to work in tech, they wouldn't fit in, and light a fire of hope that's really connected to building relationships by meeting people working in the field, having mentors, visiting tech companies, and they're really starting to understand, well, what kind of skills do I have to learn to actually do this? So we've done two summers in Oakland, and we just got a grant from Google to expand into five cities in the Bay Area. So we're trying to scale up, and this money will be super helpful to help us buy Chromebooks and other kinds of equipment and to pay instructors as we expand, because we'll be going into other communities like Oakland where there may not be funding to actually start next summer. I would love to invite all of you guys, if you live in the area or you're in the Bay Area and you're interested in volunteering, being a mentor, helping out, we'll be on the peninsula, we hope to be in San Francisco, to get in touch with me. It's susan at hackthehood.org. It's on the Hack the Hood website, and we're actively looking to grow our program. It can be anything from an afternoon to a six-week stint, a couple of hours a week. But if you've thought about giving back and you kind of want to grow more people in your own image, um, we have some very, very smart young people, but they really need relationships and they really need opportunities. So thank you so much for this opportunity. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Susan. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Okay. Okay, uh, so uh, I was just left to tell you how to get to the party, but before I do, someone uh, left this, which is a... Uh, aha! There you go, that's easy. <laughs> do you know what it is yet, or do you just, just fancy something? <laughs> okay, I believe you. Um, <laughs> okay, so uh, I think all we have left is... Uh, here's how to get to Akamai. Uh, the directions are also on the hub, so if you want to go to edgeconf.com slash hub, there's a link there to uh, the directions. It's about a 30-minute walk, or you can take a cab, um, and we'll see you there. And, oh, and you need to take your pass. If you don't have your lanyard, you won't get in. See you there. <laughs>